Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, as Whit said, I'm Phil Hodson. I'm your conference minister. And for those who might be new to this tradition, uh, what is a conference minister exactly? It's a person who drives a lot of miles. I average about 40,000 miles a year. And if you've seen the big white pickup truck outside, you'll wonder just how crazy I am. Now, what else does a conference minister do? How, how do you think of that? Well, if you come from some traditions, you might be familiar with the word bishop. And that's fine. You can think of me like a bishop with less bling and even far less authority. Conference ministers' influence, uh, ministry is one of influence. It's one of coaching and guiding and walking alongside. For in the United Church of Christ, we're not a hierarchical denomination. Rather, we speak with each other. So you'll find from time to time that I want to speak with you. I prefer a dialogue because everywhere I go, I learn from you. And hopefully bring things in your midst that I've learned from other places that may be a blessing. You can also think about the conference minister this way. Anybody like a buffet restaurant? Anybody like buffets? I am audience participation, by the way. I mean, we all hate buffets. Okay, good. A few people are willing to play along. Uh, the neat thing about buffets and conference ministers is you can take what you like that I have to say and leave the rest. And when I get in that big white truck and leave, I'll never know the difference. <laughs> and that works out well for everybody. So you're in a time of transition on so many levels. And what I find in our lives is when we're in a moment of great stress or anxiety or transition, individually, collectively, in organizations where we serve or participate, or just in our own families, is we get trapped in binary thinking. Everything becomes A or B. And I find this incredibly present in the life of the church throughout its history. At 42, I'm the youngest conference minister in the group of 36, by a little bit. I have four young sons at home. And so when I come into a congregation, I'm looking at things a little differently. I don't know the history, I don't know the background, and I'm coming first as a parent of small children. So I have a certain list I'm judging by in my head, right, when I look around. But what I recognize is that among my colleagues and friends, when they step into a congregation, they're coming in with a different list of preconceived thoughts and things that they judge against. And we're way A or B, yes or no, what is there, what is not. Anybody remember um, the felt boards from Sunday school? Anybody have those growing up, the felt boards with the little characters and things you'd put up? A few of you, okay. So I remember those. And so does my son, oh, my oldest son, Xander. He turned 11 uh, on Friday. And we served a church where they still used the felt boards when he was coming up in Sunday school. And they used them when I was coming up in Sunday school. The church where I grew up had them too, and I remember that. But I didn't have an iPad. I didn't have computers. I had cartoons on PBS and a few other TV shows, right? Back when you had to pull the thing and push the buttons on the television. I still remember that, even at 42. That wasn't his experience at all, so he would come out of Sunday school profoundly disappointed and really frustrated, and he would beg me not to go. Beg me not to go. But of course, he was the pastor's son, so, you know, you're stuck with it. <laughs> and I thought about this, and I realized this is the only place in his life where he's not immersed in the things that he connects with everywhere else. So the disconnect, the chasm is too big and he can't bridge it. And thereafter we were called to plant a church so we planted the child care area with a floor that you could literally bounce on when you fell down a video game system that broadcast into the floor to make them run for 20 minutes so that they would go home tired and nap. <laughs> and curriculum was delivered on iPads. And we went into this space where that ministry grew because it related to their present experience. Throughout our history, the Christian church has a tradition of appropriating from its present experience. You know the stories of Christmas trees, the stories of pipe organs. We didn't invent them. We stole them, lock, stock, and barrel from other people and changed the story behind 
and make them our own. Right? Pipe organs came out of bars. That's where that originated. Christmas trees came out of paganism. That's where that originated. And we just changed the story along the way. And we engaged with a broader swath of people as a result. Now, it seems to me everywhere in our world right now we're faced with, as was referenced in the invocation this morning, turmoil. Name for me, please, something in the newspaper, something in social media, something you've encountered in the last week that involves an example of binary thinking. <laughs> Say again. Yes, pro-life or pro-choice, right? It's all or nothing. Either it's nothing with no exceptions or anything else, or it's anything goes. That is a common narrative in the meta, right? At its most basic level, it's a common narrative. Here's one that I've been paying attention to this week. Student loan forgiveness. All right? $10,000 to individuals below a certain income level. Up to 20 if you had a Pell Grant. And there are those who would, in one hand, wave a Bible. I should check that I'm not holding that upside down. Photo bops. <laughs> and in another, to be rate forgiveness. Right? A or B. I, it's either or in so much of our lives. But when we do that, we compartmentalize. We become identitarian. You are this or you are that. You are red or you are blue, right? But you are more than red or blue, are you not? I have four sons. If you were to look at them in a photograph, you would see that they are definitely brothers. And they are definitely their mother's son. She'll tell you they're definitely mine. I think it's the ears. But they are unique individuals. One is gluten and dairy free. One eats anything. One argues about everything and is louder than all the others. And one just kind of hangs out and rolls with it. Right? I like certain types of food, but not others. And so do you. We have this tendency in our lives to compartmentalize people. To compartmentalize experience. And from time to time to compartmentalize how things work in the life of the church and our faith journey together. Anybody ever read the book of Nehemiah? Yeah, all right, fair enough. So I encourage you to take the time to do that. Um, it is just a few chapters long, and you can read it in an hour and a half. Cover to cover and actually understand the point of the story in an hour and a half, which is quite remarkable. You can't do that with most novels today. Nehemiah, you can do that. Now, the story of Nehemiah is interesting because he was a cupbearer for the king. He was not an engineer. He was not a builder, and he was not a priest. He was a cupbearer for the king who was inspired to go back and rebuild the walls at Jerusalem. Now, the people had been in exile, and some were there in Jerusalem, and some were in other places. They had been scattered, but he was inspired by God to go back and orchestrate the rebuilding of the wall. Why? Because Jerusalem kept getting raided, right? It wasn't working. It wasn't safe like it used to be. So they began with rebuilding the walls. Concurrently, they were rebuilding the temple, but they don't talk much about that because he wasn't a priest, so he didn't do that. He orchestrated rebuilding the walls, and he orchestrated the people through a long and arduous process, right? Because rebuilding a wall took a lot longer then than it does now. They divided up into groups, and each person was responsible for a segment, and some took hold of a gate. And all of those are chronicled in the story of Nehemiah, who the people were that did the work, and interestingly enough, whose children and grandchildren they were. A nod to their history. A nod to those who had gone before them and cared for those same things. Who had stewarded this place and left it for them as their inheritance. That they might build it up and leave it for the next as theirs. That, on one level, is the point of the story. That we are all on this continuum and we have a role to play. And we're bigger than any one thing, identity, idea. There's more possibility for us. It's not A or B, it's both. In what areas 
areas of your life right now, outside of the church, do you find yourself falling into A or B? It's easy to get down into the mud, is it not, in the realm of politics and media and everything we see? Because we are bombarded with binary thinking everywhere we go. I was on a, a Zoom call yesterday with the Reverend Dr. Susan Thistlethwaite. She is a United Church of Christ theologian, a brilliant mind, and the former president of Chicago Theological Seminary. And she was leading a discussion on what it is to be a just peace church, which came from a proclamation issued by the General Senate of the United Church of Christ in 1985, the same year that the United Church of Christ General Senate uh, voted on a resolution to become an open and affirming church. Those two things happen at the same time. One is a proclamation, which is an idea expressed, and one is a resolution, which gives it legs and builds an organizational system and infrastructure in the life of the church that allows us to stand up today and say we are an open and affirming congregation and we know what that means. We know what to do with it. But she was on the Phil Donahue show some years ago, debating theology. Anybody remember Phil Donahue? You know, daytime talk shows from when I was a kid remind me a lot of turning on any news program today. We used to segment that till 10 o'clock in the morning so that people had nothing else to do were the only ones watching it. Now it's everywhere all the time. It bombards us, this binary thinking, and the shouting, and the arguing, and the fighting, and the putting each other in little boxes and compartments and keeping us there in identitarian thought. And she was talking, and a woman in the audience stood up and said, make sure I'm doing this right, I live every word of my Bible. I am a Christian. To which Dr. Thistlethwaite responded with a question. Good, but have you sold all your possessions and given them to the poor? <laughs> the woman stood there for about 15 seconds with the cameras on her and said, well, that's not meant to be taken literally. <laughs> you have a great many decisions to make. Here's what I want you to hear this morning and more next week. You are not in a moment of A or B. You are not in a place of binary thinking. You are in a place of both and. You are those who are called to steward all that has been done before you. To carry forward your history and your stories. And to write new chapters that others will carry forward after. And that's an exciting thing. It is not without stress. It is not without frustration. It will not be without, as Whit said, difficult choices. But they are not always A or B. There's more. There's another way of thinking about it, both and. You can do this and do that. And that's what God calls us to do in every new generation. We're called to raise up our youth and young people, our kids, that we might share with them the stories of our faith, that they will live them out, just as we have. But we can't still do that with felt words. And there will come a time when my boys are grown, when iPads go the way of the dinosaurs. And I can't even conceive of what we'll be looking at then. But that doesn't cause me fear or anxiety. It brings me joy and as I look around our South Central Conference and every congregation I visit, I see those spaces of joy and hope, and I see them in you. I see them in this moment of great question and great opportunity. The neat thing about the story of our faith is we don't know where it ends. The scriptures never tell us that. It just keeps going generation to generation to generation, lived out in new iterations, in new possibilities, but the message is still the same. It's simply the medium that changes. And each of us, in our own moments in time, has the opportunity to embrace it and then to share it. That is how Jesus could express confidence when he said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. 
and the gates of hell will not overtake it. That's the promise we live out in every generation. That we will take what we are given and we will carry it forward, not in the same way, but in a way that meets everyone where they are. That is our mission. That is our call. May we do so with grace and compassion. And may the anxiety that we do feel be tempered by the hope of the joy that in our scriptures we are promised and we know deep in our bones is always to come. May it be so for you. Amen. Amen.